So now I want to talk about a different example. I want to talk about how the body regulates CO2. Now, CO2 is an output of any oxidative process, including burning energy in the muscles, puts out CO2 and water. So as your muscles are active, they are putting out CO2. Now, too much CO2 is not good. It's called carbonic acidosis. And we don't want it. So we have evolved a control of breathing to regulate CO2. After all, what is the function of breathing? Well, it has two functions. Number one, intake oxygen, but also output CO2 into the environment and get it out of the bloodstream. So how does the body control CO2? Well, by controlling the breathing rate, the ventilation rate. You can think of breathing as shoveling in oxygen and shoveling out CO2. If you have too much CO2, then a real good way to get rid of that excess CO2 is to increase the breathing rate, increase the ventilation rate, because then you're just shoveling faster. And if you shovel faster, you'll get rid of that CO2 and thereby maintain CO2 homeostasis. Now, in order to do that, the, in order for the brainstem to control the ventilation rate to regulate CO2, it also has to have the information to know what the CO2 level is. So there have to be, and there are, <clears throat> chemoreceptors in the brainstem that sense CO2 concentration. So here is our negative feedback loop. CO2 goes up, brainstem senses that, sends instructions to increase the ventilation rate, and CO2 is brought back to normal level. Now, let's make a differential equation model. Following, I should say, the work of Mackey and Glass in, in a series of paper, beautiful papers laying this out. First of all, let x be the CO2 concentration, that's our single state variable, is CO2 concentration. And now we make a differential equation. X prime equals what makes CO2 go up minus what makes CO2 go down. So just in words, what makes CO2 go up is muscle output. And what makes CO2 go down is respiratory removal. Now we got to put some math on there. The first assumption is this is the form of the differential equation. Muscle output, we're just going to have a constant L. So if you want to model exercise, increase L because you're going to put out more CO2. So muscle output is a constant. Then respiratory removal, why does it have this form V times X? It's because how much dirt you can get rid of is equal to the amount of dirt per shovel full 
times shovels per minute. So it's CO2 per shovelful times shovels per minute. Shovels per minute is V, the ventilation rate, and the amount of CO2 in a shovel full is the CO2 concentration. So the amount of CO2 being put out is equal to V times X. Shovels per minute times dirt per shovel. Now, what is V? We still have to say something about the ventilation rate. How does the ventilation rate increase by the brain stem when it sees increasing amounts of CO2? So this was a series of famous experiments by the physiologist A.V. Hill, and this is what he found, a sigmoid. In fact, sigmoids are often called Hill functions in physiology in honor of Hill, who first discovered this in the control of ventilation by CO2. And so what you see is that as CO2 goes up, the ventilation rate goes up. It obviously can't go up infinitely. It has to saturate. And therefore, it has to have the form of a sigmoid. And once again, the upgoing sigmoid can have various slopes. It can be very gentle feedback, as in the n equals 2 black tracing. It can be more sensitive feedback, like the n equals 5 red. It can be very sensitive, like the n equals 9 blue. And what is the mathematical form of these sigmoids? Well, you know this already. This is x to the n over 1 plus x to the n, where n is that n which is the steep, modulates the steepness of the feedback function. Now, I said this is negative feedback, but it's an upgoing sigmoid, but that's not a problem because it's an upgoing sigmoid with a minus sign in front of it. And so by having a minus sign in front of it, this is negative feedback, even though the curve is going up. The curve is going up, indicating that the removal rate is going to increase. So we have a model. We put that x to the n over 1 plus x to the n. We put that in here as our ventilation rate. This function, x to the n over 1 plus x to the n, saturates at 1, which is not the value we want. We want it to saturate at a, at a v max. So we just multiply that term by v max. And so we got v max x to the n over 1 plus x to the n. That's the ventilatory rate times x, which is the CO2 concentration. So there is our differential equation model, except that's not completely accurate. And the reason is we have an x here that is the CO2 concentration in the lungs because that's where the shoveling is taking place. And we have an X here, and that is the CO2 concentration at the brain stem because that's where the sensing takes place. And the problem is that this X does not equal this X. We have two different x's. x at the lungs is not the same as x at the brain stem because it took 10 or 15 seconds for the blood to get from the lung up to the brain stem. 
And so the brain stem is trying to control the system <clears throat> based upon outdated information. That's only 10 seconds outdated, and it's a little bit of an exaggeration to call it outdated, but it is old information. What's being done is being done to this quantity x, but what's being done depends upon this quantity x, and they are not the same. So we have to introduce a new terminology. And the new terminology is called time delay. And I'm going to define the symbol x sub tau, that's Greek lowercase tau. x sub tau, we're going to define as the value of x tau seconds ago, where tau is the time delay. So this is a very useful concept, and we need it in our equation, and we're going to put it into our equation. And now this is the really correct form of the differential equation x prime, this is what's going on in the brain stem, and these are the old values of x measured from the point of view of the lungs. The brain stem is seeing what x was 10 seconds ago. So that's x sub tau, and then this x is just x because that's the current value of CO2 concentration at the lung. Now we have an interesting differential equation. This is called the Mackey glass differential equation. And we want to know how does it behave. So we bring up Python and we code this up. And we start to look at the response. So the first interesting response is that for low values of n and tau, now remember n is the slope of the feedback, tau is the time delay in the feedback. So for low values of n, and low values of tau, we get a very nice approach to a stable equilibrium. But when n and tau get large, the upper tracing is the output of the model for larger n and tau and remember that this V here is the ventilation rate. This is not breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. This is the ventilation rate, which in a normal person sitting quietly, the ventilation rate is constant. You're breathing at, you know, 20 breaths per second or whatever. But when N and tau are large, the ventilation rate becomes oscillatory. Now, this is a pathology. It's called chain Stokes respiration. And if you go down certain wards, the heart failure ward is one, and there are neuro aspects of neuro wards. You can actually walk down the corridor, you can hear chain Stokes respiration coming from the patient room. It sounds like, as you see in the tracing, it sounds like <laughs> And that's repeated, as you see in the tracing here, which is a real tracing uh, from a chain Stokes patient. 
So now I said you get this oscillatory response when n is large and when tau is large. And now you want to ask what's the trade-off? What's the interplay? We have two parameters here, not one. We've been used to one parameter. You change the parameter, it changes the behavior or not. Now we have two parameters and a little bit of simulation, actually a lot of simulation, gives you a very interesting relationship that when n is small and tau is small, we are in this part of parameter space. Notice this is not state space. This is parameter space. Low n, low tau, no oscillation, but big n and big tau do give you oscillation, and the demarcation zone is that thick black line. So now, with this picture in mind, that we have two different handles on the system. We have the sensitivity, which is modulated by n, and we have the time delay, which is modulated by tau. And both of these can be operating in a given system. A really good example of this is in the muscle stretch reflex, which, what's called the monosynaptic 1A uh, spinal stretch reflex. So how does that work? Well, here I'm holding my arm at a roughly constant position. And I'm doing that because I have this stretch reflex. And the stretch reflex says, basically, when the muscle length is stretched, that the stretch receptors in the muscle send positive signals to the motor neuron and they increase motor neuron firing in the spinal cord there, and the increased motor neuron firing then makes the muscle contract. And that's a minus on L, obviously. So increased L increases motor neuron firing, increased motor neuron firing decreases L. So we have a beautiful example of a negative feedback loop. The 1A afferent neuron that sends the signal to the motor neuron increases the motor neuron and the motor neuron decreases muscle length. And so that, in a typical case, maintains a kind of a constant value as I'm doing right now. Now, there are diseases that affect muscle control. Some of them are increases in N, and some of them are increases in tau. For example, Multiple sclerosis, MS, is a demyelinating disease. So what does demyelinating mean? Well, myelin is the insulation on the neuron, on the axon of the long axon of the neuron. And that insulation, which is myelin, enables the signal to travel nice and quickly without dissipating down the axon of the neuron. So if you have a demyelinating disease, you lose that insulation. The signal travels more slowly to the spinal cord and then back again to the muscle, and that increases time delays in the system. 
And those increased time delays in the system due to demyelination produce oscillations in muscle control, which is what we call tremor. Tremor is a pathological oscillation in muscle produced by, in this case, excess time delays in the motor control system. Now, it's interesting, if you ask a lot of neurologists, why do MS patients have tremor, you'll get a kind of a hand-waving answer about, well, demyelination means that communication is, is messed up in the system, it's not communicating properly, and so you're going to get an oscillation. And that, that's just not going to cut it. That's not an adequate explanation. Here is a simple and straightforward one that says that the tremor is an oscillation which is being produced in a negative feedback loop by the introduction of increased time delays. Now there's another mechanism. If you have a stroke, for example, the brain sends descending signals, rubrospinal descending signals that damp down stretch reflexes in the normal person. But when a stroke interrupts those depressive descending commands, you get what is called hyperreflexia. And the hyperreflexia means that the stretch reflex negative feedback loop becomes hypersensitive. And by becoming hypersensitive, you have increased the gain in the sensitivity in the feedback loop, and that will also produce oscillation. So we have two different mechanisms to produce muscle tremor. One of them is a brain loss of the inhibition of the reflex, which is the N mechanism. And the other kind of disease is a demyelinating disease, which produces tremor by a tau mechanism. Incidentally, here's a nice experiment of muscle tremor uh, in a normal person exacerbated by having to hold a heavy weight. So in holding the heavy weight, you begin to go into tremor, and that's what the tremor looks like, and that's by increasing the gain. The increased weight increases the gain in the uh, feedback relation, and you go into tremor due to that external perturbation. There are other oscillations, for example, Parkinsonian tremor, which, whose origin is not really well known and which need to be examined using mathematical models. But the key is that the stroke mechanism increases in and a demyelinating disease increases tau. 